right, welcome back everyone. This feels a little awkward because like everyone is sitting over here and you're totally out of my vision. Would y'all be willing to move this way? <laughs> I'm totally serious, will you humor me? Just everyone shift this way, come on. There's a huge blank spot right there. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you. Tomorrow I'll bring, it'll be like Oprah, and there'll be treats underneath the chairs in the middle. Just to incentivize this. Is there anyone new who's joining us after lunch who wasn't here this morning? All right, we've got a couple of folks. Okay. So for those of you who weren't here, the one of you, I'm Laura Runnels. It's very nice to meet you. Do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Who are you? Me or you? To me. Go ahead. I'm John Gravenstein from Merck Vaccine. Okay, great. Well, we have a lot of uh, federal folks here and a handful of local, some other uh, pharma and biotech groups here. So nice, nice range, uh, state and local, excuse me. So we are... Uh, I'm really excited to kick off this next panel discussion. Uh, this one is about existing data sets and challenges with the sources. We have a nice panel here that's gonna help us out with this discussion. We have Rona Cooper, who's the Public Health Preparedness Clinical Coordinator with the Philadelphia uh, Department of Public Health. And then uh, Skip Francis, the Director for Data Mining and Informatics Evaluation and Research for the Center of Drug Evaluation and Research with the FDA. And being the director of data mining just sounds really cool. Do you get to like wear a hat with a light on it? Uh, Eva Lee, who's the director for the Center for Operations Research in Medicine and Healthcare uh, with the H. Milton Stewart School of Industrial and System Engineering at the Georgia Institute of Technology. And Joe Vasey, who's the, an epidemiologist and biostatistician with Practice Fusion. Great, so thank you all for uh, joining us today for this panel. Before the break, I uh, asked everyone to write down on um, a piece, on their little yellow pieces of paper, what question they wanted answered um, when they were thinking about MCMs and um, safety and efficacy, what information they needed. So I took a, a second to go and look at the sheets that were on the wall, and I just wanted to give everyone kind of a, a quick summary of what I saw. So it seems like the basic question that everyone is trying to answer is, uh, how is the um, medical countermeasure doing harm or doing good, harm or good? That's sort of the basic question. Um, and then once we know the, if it is doing harm or is beneficial, there are a bunch of whys that come after that. So why, why is it doing harm? We could chase the, the, you know, go down the rabbit hole of whys, um, but basically we're trying to define or describe the harm or benefit that's being done. And there are a bunch of questions related to that that are up on the wall. So uh, what is the, what's the, uh, what does harm or benefit look like for different populations? Um, how does it relate to adherence or compliance? What are the comorbidities for the populations? Uh, how many people received it? When did they receive it? How quickly after exposure or, or when in the timing of the threat did they receive it? Uh, what biological information do we have, labs, et cetera? Uh, what guidance were they given about adherence and compliance? Um, how is it being used? Was it on-label use, off-label use? Um, so basically, once we define the harm or the benefit, we're asking the standard questions, who, what, when, where, why, and how, um, to get to that. Did anyone else take a second to look at the yellow cards? Did I leave anything major out? And the reason why I'm doing this is for the remainder of today and for tomorrow, we are going to be keeping this question in mind. So uh, our, our, the basic question that we're trying to answer is, uh, how is the medical countermeasure doing harm or the countermeasure doing harm or benefit? Is it benefiting the population as intended or is it harming them as not intended? Okay, and with that, panelists. So now that we have a better understanding of uh, the question that needs to be answered, so are we doing harm or are we doing benefit, uh, let's talk about what types of existing data sets are out there that might help answer that question and 
where we can find that data. So if each of you, just from your perspectives, when you think about what harm or benefit means in the context of your work, what kinds of data would you use right now to answer that question? So uh, again, I'm Rona Cooper. I'm from the Philadelphia Department of Public Health. So I'm a very local jurisdiction. And uh, some of my colleagues will say that I generally bring conversations down to its lowest point. <laughs> I'm going to take that as a compliment. Um, and what I'd like to express is that from a local jurisdiction point of view, uh, the most raw source of data is obviously the patient interview. Uh, I know that a lot of discussion has been about the products and what they do. Um, and I, you know, if I look at it visually, I see MCMs as a discussion over here, what, are the, what is the pharmaceutical nature? What do they do? What harm do they do? But uh, we don't quite start from that point. We start down at the bottom, which is what is the patient telling us? Who is the patient? What do they need? What are their issues? Uh, we have many sources of data that we use. Uh, we use the Pennsylvania uh, Immunization Information System, SIS. We use something uh, similar to what others have mentioned, uh, Knowledge Center with a health information component to it. Uh, none of these systems talk to each other. When we activate uh, a pod or do a pod exercise, we are required to create a database from scratch using access, and it's time consuming. We don't have the uh, time, the expertise, the, the information technology background to be able to do more than what is essentially a primitive database. We know what the questions are. We receive guidance from the CDC about various countermeasures, about various products, about uh, various bioagents. And I think for the most part, except for the strange outliers, we know what questions we would ask were we to have to uh, activate. So those algorithms that we already have from federal sources are what we use to create our database. Uh, we did a uh, dual model anthrax response exercise some years ago. And uh, in it, we created a screening tool that was extensive in the questions that it asked that would allow us to uh, look at patients and determine whether they needed a change in the regimen, whether they needed, uh, whether they were having adverse reactions. But what that database lacked was the long-term follow-up components, uh, the issues like when is the next appointment to get a vaccine. Uh, and we, we struggle with those kinds of, uh, I guess, what we're looking for is something that can be created per MCM, per bioagent, that uh, any local jurisdiction could use depending on the scenario. So. so when you're thinking about harm and benefit at the local level, uh, you the source of data that you would think of first and go to first is the patient interviews. Absolutely, the patient interviews. We train. Uh, in our activation, we train our volunteers, Medical Reserve Corps folks generally, who are mostly clinicians, and uh, our own Department of Health staff to do uh, an interview that, uh, with input into an electronic database. We use scanners to, uh, for driver's licenses, to slide driver's licenses that enters demographic information. I should mention uh, the business about Disney World and the uh, bracelets. That's something that is used in uh, mass casualty response in Philadelphia through the Knowledge Center. And uh, um, the wristbands have 
uh, barcodes that allow hospitals and EMS to communicate. So we know that that kind of information, that kind of a data system is available. We've just not been able to use it uh, in our local response. Okay. Thank you. So, uh, the, Joe, when you think about uh, safety, uh, the, the harm and benefit of MCMs, what, what data would you look to to help you figure that out? Well, uh, we would approach that from a slightly different perspective because we actually are a, a data warehouse in a sense. Um, Practice Fusion is um, a software company that um, develops and distributes and maintains an EHR system. And um, it's a cloud-based system, so uh, it's, it's unlike what you often see based on servers, and, and being cloud-based allows it to be adaptable and flexible. So when we think about like assessing harm, for example, um, you know, we have a continuous data feed from all the people who use our system and can monitor particular events, look for particular events. Is your and mic, I'm sorry, is your mic on? Um, I think so. It is. It is. Yeah, I'm hearing it. Barbara? Is that any better? Yeah? Okay. Okay. <coughs> it's odd to hear yourself echoing off the back of the house. Yes. <laughs> um, so the, it being cloud-based um, means it's, it's flexible and adaptable, and, and we can roll out um, particular modules to monitor certain things. Um, so for example, um, uh, when, when Zika became a problem, um, we added a module to it to um, provide educational material to physicians. And um, we can, in turn, also ask physicians to respond to questions about what they're doing. Um, we have um, some experience in, in doing um, monitoring um, adverse events for different kinds of medications, um, which allows a physician in, in real time, as they're talking to a patient, to record the occurrence of those things. Um, and that's something new um, that helps it, it really helps physicians get involved in reporting that kind of thing because it happens as the patient is sitting there, um, you know, and it gets recorded automatically. It doesn't require the, the physician to go back later and think about it and fill out a form and, you know, relay the form to, um, you know, like the FDA or, or CDC or whoever's collecting the data. Um, that can be rolled into the actual EHR. Um, you know, the other thing that, um, cloud-based systems um, allow you to do is monitor events in real time. So, um, you know, if, if you have a, for example, when, when the um, H1N1 influenza problem popped up in 2009 or so, um, in, in a cloud-based system, you can see that happen day by day, at, you know, where it's being reported, who it's happening to, how many people it's happening to, what the response to it is, um, and you can track that as it spreads across the country. Um, you know, so these um, kind of agile, adaptable, flexible cloud systems allow you to do those kinds of things, which you couldn't really do easily, um, say, even five years ago. Skip? Well, when you think about the harm and benefit, how do you, what data do you use to figure out whether an MCM is harming or benefit, benefiting your constituency? Well, I define the terms and then the uh, circumstances. So for uh, safety in, in the FDA parlance is unintentional or unexpected consequences that cause a negative outcome, either clinical or otherwise. And then for efficacy, as we would call it, would be a positive effect that would either arrest or mitigate the particular circumstance. So there's a lot of stuff around that in terms of endpoints or other things, but that's the general gist of it. I explain our approach in the context of MCM uh, using the H1N1 experience. Uh, back in 2009, I was working in the surveillance and epidemiology division of FDA, so I was one of many people looking at about 6,000 different reports trying to figure out for safety reports which things were negative or positive. We were all determined at that time to develop a system to answer just that question. And some of the answers to that has already been given in terms of how do you de detect these things in real time. First, let's understand the, the anatomy of an H1N1 epidemic. If you actually map it out, it was actually nearly a year's process from the first detection in April 
where you had 28 days where CDC had the acute reporting of identifying the virus, de determining what kind of virus it was, it was a quad resort, as you remember. And then right after that, NIH and FDA came in and said, well, what things do we have that could intervene right now? So the databases in those cases are existing epidemiologic bases, which tend to favor what CDC has, population bases in collaboration with the state system, which is extremely important because now you have 50 people who could, 50 uh, institutions that could link right away. However, if you look at how the epidemic evolved over time, we had to shift databases. Because now we realize we had a 15% resistant of virus. Okay, well, what do we do in that case? What do we have in our inventory that might be able to help in the intervention? And that's where you start getting the new things like Paramivir, which was an unapproved drug which had a lot of unknown parameters. In which cases, you start looking at different kinds of information to estimate or predict what the safety or efficacy might be. So for the protease inhibitors, we have a profile of what that was that was in our uh, clinical pharmacology groups. So you know what the active moiety might do, and we'll be looking for that as we look prospectively to how we intervene. And then over time, we realized that the safety part for Paramivir was very late in the epidemic. It actually started in January, or about nearly seven months after the epidemic started. And the safety detection was very difficult, because as uh, people like uh, Perrin Kafka tell you, when it was used as a salvage therapy, it was very difficult to pick up something in a very noisy clinical environment. So we created a system that uh, this gentleman just articulated, a cloud-based system to be able to acquire information that could be looked at in real time. Now, I have to categorize that because when we say data, it's not the same for every one of us in this room. So we stratified it into three groups. For people who are at a large institutional level like BARDA, they're looking for case, location, and association with interventions that they control, like stockpiles and things like that. For hospitals, it's more situational and regional control. So they want the cases for what's relevant to their area. The unique group, when we talk about physicians, and I'm a practicing physician, is we're looking at more streaming information. And that's important because the databases used in that case, where it's extracted from an electronic health record mm -hmm. or other electronic databases, is very different for the computer person. And then the analytic tools we use tend to break down because as the speed and volume of the information goes up, our traditional Bayesian approaches <coughs> tend not to work. So if I was to summarize how we use the different databases, we make the assumption that every database has something to tell us. The question is what? So if I was to reconstruct an epidemic, social media is very important because it will tell you if something bad, awful, and it's going to be really noticeable. It tends to be stimulated reporting that people get scared. As the epidemic develops, then you start getting your different information sources to do population first because we tend to have those monitored on a regular basis. And then you're going to get into specifics and streaming information. We need individual information that's new or a changing pattern. So for us, we look at as many information sources as we can, recognize we need a flexible platform and also need flexible tools, some of which are used in other industries like banking and defense, but should be applied in the health uh, scenario. So I guess, I guess this uh, segue is, is actually perfect and in terms of like uh, what you mentioned about the type of data. So I, I guess um, I love data and I'm very used to like different type of data. So in terms of the, um, I really see multiple levels of type of data that we use. For example, um, from the containment point of view in uh, pandemic or, or emergent threats, like using Sika as an example, is that we use data of epidemiology data of the regional area, the human travel patterns, their social behavior patterns, the all the vectors information. So in this case, the mosquitoes, like, um, all the uh, spread in terms of where, how many of them they are and how they spread around and the atmospheric uh, information about the moisture in the air. And basically looking at the population and how they interact and basically um, like interacting and have the chance of infecting each other. Then we overlay that with the operational side is how do you actually provide containment. In the case, now we talk about MCM and, and for Sika, there was no MCM available. I think the containment is critical because if we are not able to contain the, uh, to really decrease the number of infection, then we will really have a high burden because we have to monitor the patient that are pregnant and we have to also monitor the babies and, and, and like not just at birth or, or during pregnancy, but also lifelong really monitoring in terms of like how their cognitive is, is doing. So the type of data we are using then, you see, is the human side where it has the behavioral and the clinical side. 
the vector, the disease part, the disease cycle, and how the disease spread, and, and how you can monitor those and, and use those information, as well as the environment that is brooding all this uh, infection. Then we also use the operational side. I think one of the challenges, I think George is really good in talking about, is that one of the challenges is that we have a lot of information about biology and the clinical setting. How do you interact those and, and interlace those with the operations? So that means I want to know if this is how the disease spread, how do I optimize that operation so that I can actually have some control over the disease with the, with the understanding that there's so much un unknown in front of us. So that's the part that I will see is, is really from disease spread to the operational side. I use all type of data that is available. And I also use the EMRR data in terms of looking at outcome prediction. So on the more granularity part in vaccine design, like MCM design, so we are looking at like working with the clinician and also the biologist. We look at vaccine immunogenicity um, prediction. So for Zika, for example, the clinical networks, we got data from Brazil and we have data in the United States. So we look at the um, microarray data, looking at how genes can predict where the vaccine works on different level of individuals. I think that becomes really critical. We touch a point about prioritization of vaccine, so or, or MCM, who should get what. And, and by understanding which individuals would benefit from that, then we can reduce the adverse effect. We can also really deliver those uh, vaccine more efficiently. And that's also um, like the results, one of the work that we have with like uh, malaria vaccines that we were involved in identifying with the 23% efficacy of malaria vaccines, that instead of really delivering it to everyone, who should get those vaccines that will have the biggest benefit? So I think the type of data, as you see, really goes from uh, social behavior and um, EMR and even environmental type of data to really microscopic data of like the microarray data. So it's, it's pretty, um, pretty diverse. Yeah, it's a wide span of data. So if you were specifically looking, trying to determine if uh, an, a medical countermeasure had harmed uh, a patient population or provided benefit, what would you what would you look to first? I think it's like this morning we talk a lot about like what type of data we want, um, like during the as we actually dispense the the. Uh, MCM. So I think the, there is definitely a change of operations process that we have to do is that as we actually register individuals to go into the pod to get uh, the vaccine or the MCM, so they register, you pull out the, the electronic medical record should be linked in, and that after the vaccination, all those information should be linked to the immunization uh, registry. So with those information, as the individuals now, we like to say if we have data, what can we do? So if you take the medication and you don't come back, that may be a good sign, don't you think? So I, I, don't, I don't just use your data. If you are complaining you're not feeling well, then I, I know what's going on with you. But if you don't complain that you're not feeling well, that is actually a good sign is that we actually know what's going on also. So we use the known and the unknown data to actually predict what is going on with the population. There's also the part about social media. I thought that was kind of cute. Now, since I'm a professor, I deal with all the kids, right, that are 18 to 23 years old. And so I think social media has one benefit, is that you can do self-organized, like self-organized um, bio-civilian, uh, really symptomatic uh, civilians. So basically, if you register these people, and they don't really have to register in some sense, is that you tell them, well, look, if you have problem after you get the MCM, you can voice your opinion here. And that really engaged them, and it seems like this generation seems to die to tell us everything about them, right? So it's kind of an interesting part. And I personally think it is, the challenge is not about the size of the data. And of course, the data is evolving. The challenge is in the seas of data, how do you get the most critical information that allows you to actually take actions? So we can really get all the data and model. But if a model does not give me the knowledge that I do not know yet, and if those knowledge does not allow me to take action, then I will be sitting there. And I think there is a problem, right? So I need to be able to take actions that will make it better. And I think that is truly the, that's how I see like the continuum. But um, of course, I also like the gentleman say that it's, it's not, we cannot talk about it, even though we are all um, aware of the challenge. I think the next phase is that we just have to do it. 
because the data is not going to be perfect. Standardization is going to be slower than us, right? Believe it or not, because the tomorrow the doctor get this really fancy imaging. It will be silly for you to say, no, no, please use this five-year-old one. Wait till we get the standardization. No, the idea, I think the challenge is that the modelers have to be a lot more um, sophisticated. They have to be able to deal with evolving data and really give real-time information. Yeah, absolutely. This morning we heard a lot about um, the variety of options we have for data uh, sources. So we talked about uh, sensor data and machine logs, transactions, uh, things that are on the internet. So social media, uh, just data sets that are available on the internet, um, different apps that collect data about us, uh, images, audio, video, electronic records, um, archives of scanned documents, health records, et cetera. So there's a lot of data out there. Um, if you could uh, what what's one data source or data set that exists that you think is very rich that we haven't quite figured out how to tap into yet that could help us answer questions ab about harm and benefit and you know all the nuances we talked about the populations the adherence compliance comorbidities etc. What are we not tapping into that we should? Is I, I don't know the answer to that. Is there something out there that can be applied at a local level that um, that can be standardized and would provide those kinds of answers? Uh, the closest I've seen in my limited experience was um, the CRA program that is being developed by CDC um, that is uh, usable on a cell phone uh, that patients themselves are able to enter data um, and, and it is customizable to a scenario and it's my impression that that's what the work is that's being done is to customize it but that's our frustration is that there is, we, we don't know of anything out there that we at the local level can use um, for precisely those answers. Others on the panel, untapped data sources that could help us answer the question? So, to follow up what you're saying, um, you know, the, the availability of um, patient collected data, whether it's collected by an app or a device or, or whether it's uh, subjective, you know, um, like social media type things, uh, I think there's a real untapped potential there. Um, but it's difficult to know how to approach that data and merge it with more objective measures because it's, it's not standard, it's about as unstandardized as it can be. And um, trying to fit that into some kind of a structured framework that makes it amenable to uh, you know, analytic tools is, is a real difficult problem. Um, that said, I, I do think that data that comes, especially that comes from apps or devices, has a lot of potential to be integrated into existing data sources um, and, and I think some work with um, hardware manufacturers, software developers, um, can help do that to make those data sources more um, attractable and um, you know, integratable into the kinds of data, EHR data or um, you know, imaging data, things like that, that already exist. My answer actually wouldn't be a data set per se, but I think the most undeveloped resource is our own expertise and how to bridge it with what we're acquiring from data and the IT tools that we use. So for example, when we look at different data sets at FDA, there are about eight streams we use for post-market surveillance. We recognize that social media may not be great for regular surveillance, but it would give you a warning. Mm -hmm. We realize that in published biomedical literature, when you go through it using either an indexing strategy or NLP, it won't tell you what the FAIRS or acute data uh, adverse event reporting system will, will tell you, big events that are rare, but it will tell you very unusual events that are statistically too low for us to detect. So if I was to use my mind's eye in that way, the reviewer, I would say that, okay, if it's in the literature, it might be coming up in FAIRS at some point. Can I confirm this with epidemiology? And if so, what kind of studies would I set up to do that? That's the part I think is undeveloped. 
And the reason I say that is that when you start looking at things like the uh, deep learning strategies or artificial intelligence, it would be theoretically possible with our expertise to sit in front of a properly programmed Watson and say, okay, Watson, I know in this particular case I have a, a single arm study or it has five arms for oncology and have built into it the kinds of parameters we need to think about. And it can look for research sources that we normally don't think of and maybe don't have time to find and put it together. That's where I see the missing thing is, because we have a lot of data. We have a lot of highly skilled people. The question is how to get it to interact in a way that is really more real time. That's possible, but we just haven't quite gotten there yet, in my opinion. So your wish list is being able to find those signals that could point to further it's a combination of tools. I think the whole, even for data miners, I think there was a person earlier today that said, you know, for the person who's the unicorn, all of us have to be a little bit of IT, a little bit of a subject manager expert, a little bit of a statistician, and that capability in a computing engine that does a trillion connections a second should work with other things to be able to find what we want. Mm -hmm. The question is how to do that. So maybe we have that unicorn. It's just a computer. <laughs> Difficult. I, I, I think it's an interesting part when you say what type of data sets that is out there because the data is everywhere. I think the challenge of us is that if you look at the from the scientific point of view is that most models are designed for specific type of data instead of like using all the data in a systematic way so and, and also integrated way. I think I think uh, Carmen this morning mentioned about like integrating those data together is really important. And also not so much of using all the data, but it's like if you want to use all the data, you have to use them intelligently. I think that's also very important. It has to be real time. And uh, do we have the technology yet for a from AI and uh, and all the experts in, in modeling that we have? The answer is we are not there yet because if, if you look at um, airline problems, transportation problems, all those data, or even marketing and consumer problems, is that those data, they look very beautiful compared to healthcare. If you look at healthcare data, so we, we finished analyzing 737 sites of um, clinical sites. And so we link all the EMR data together. It's very interesting. Even if you just look at one disease, you will notice that your data is all totally different from each patient. So the challenge is how do you use this data in the most effective way and be able to really model them effectively and get answer from that. So I think, I think that is really the challenge. And also my feeling is that um, this is really we have to do it no matter whether we are ready or not. So the data is going to continue and the modeler and the science, scientists have to continue and then there has to be a, 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 loop, a loop, a feedback system so that they could improve in terms of the ability to make a real-time decision. It, one small thought, that this, some of the technology that we're talking about in terms of AI and deep learning and all that, it's already being used. I mean, all of us carry a credit card and probably within about four seconds, Citibank can tell you exactly what you're doing. That's what we're trying to do now is try to apply it to health. So I, the question I would ask is, are the technologies that are used for targeting defense, which I've seen some of that, it's amazing what they can do with a lot of noisy data, or in banking, can we apply some of those for help in an appropriate way? The technology to some degree is already there, including AI approaches. The question is, how do we use it? Mm -hmm. I do want to say, though, we are actually the one providing the banking. Mm -hmm. Those technologies, <laughs> they are way ahead. No, yeah. I think the healthcare data really is a lot uglier than the finance data. I have to. I think we need to embrace the ugliness instead of thinking that they are just like the same. So I think it is okay. The data could be ugly, but we can handle it. But if we want to say, well, finance data, we can handle it really well. Why can't we do it like this for healthcare? The answer is that they are quite different. So I think we also need to realize the difference. And let's, um, let's talk about the differences. Let's talk about the ugly. So we, we heard a little bit about uh, standardization. That's one of the ugly parts of health data, right? And uh, uh, connecting data sources, this idea of integrating data, that's ugly. What else is ugly about health data? And what does that mean for you? I think for, once again, I hate to kind of beat a dead horse or a unicorn either. Is <laughs> I I think we um, we don't have the capacity uh, at the local level. Um, I mean that's really the bottom line. We don't have the capacity at the local level to collect the data 
that you who analyze data wish us to collect. Um, we don't have the guidance for it uh, beyond paper-based information, EUAs and INDs, and um, we need you to produce for us that which will help you go beyond that, uh, that next step. Uh, we struggle with the, the primitive nature of what happens at that dispensing operation. And uh, unless you help us with that, you know, we're going to stay with an unstandardized, uh, self-created, um, best guess kind of format for answering questions. What else is ugly about health data? <laughs> in where these data streams come from, and I think this is kind of what you're getting at, is, is um, the way you, your data stream, you, the way you collect data, the way I collect it, the way you collect it, are all different, even if we think we're all collecting the same thing. Um, we, have, we emphasize different features, we, we look at different events and interpret them differently. Um, and particularly with um, electronic medical system, record systems, um, you know, those are built with uh, um, really to benefit the physician, not the researcher. And I think the researchers, we often forget that as researchers and, and, and get frustrated with the data because it's not collected the way you would want it to be collected <laughs> for, for research purposes, but that's not its initial purpose. So I, I think that um, when we design and, and develop data collection systems, we need to keep in mind um, that there are multiple purposes for those systems, for the, you know, the immediate user, maybe the physician or the, the practice, but then also people like us who you know, want to be able to use that to do predictive analytics with and, um, and need a slightly different, less fuzzy, less ugly kind of input to the work we're doing. I think, I think it's interesting. I think there are, in the thin DMR, for those of you that use it, is that they are very standard like terms that they use. But EMR also include many unstructured tags. If you, like, like for, for, the, um, for the 700 sites that we link all the EMR together, there were like 150 different ways for the doctors to explain the same thing. So if you truly think about it, that's a text mining just to merge all these data that actually mean the same thing and exactly like what you mentioned about like so how could you even if you collect those data like and how can we give you standard or, or guidelines to even collect them and that comes from philadelphia and i have to say they are very good in, in the it's in the mcm i have to say because because we were there and and uh, they actually were able to collect a lot of data compared to other sites so i think the challenge truly is that Sometimes, yes, we don't know how to collect data, but even with that type of data, it's, we don't know how to really use them effectively. But I also do not, do not know if it is really true EMR is actually designed for doctors to use because the doctors complain about that all the time. <laughs> so now, now this is very interesting because if a system is supposed to be for the doctors to collect everything and not for us to analyze, but yet the, the doctors end up complaining about it because they cannot pull out even their own, you know, just one patient, then you start to question truly maybe we really have to really being able to like pull the data out. So I know Kaiser has designed some of these, uh, these kind of like um, software where it allows data to be pulled out. And I think that's really the first step is that you connect them and you are able to pull out data and you just pull out whatever that you need for um, MCM uh, like in terms of response and then use those information. So it doesn't have to be perfect, but at least you can go from there. The, the only thing I say, I think the MCM provides an opportunity to provide a focus and define what your particular problem is. When you do general surveillance, we have to realize that for everybody, I have never seen a pneumonia present the same way in the past 30 years of clinical practice. So in an EMR, it might be very hard to find it just because of that variety. So sometimes the MCM definition can help very much with that. Uh, the other thing is the same thing with our drug safety. We, we look at a, a drug that's released into the market 
Normally the testing is done in less than 20,000 people, so we get a good sense for people between 15 and I think it's 55. Well, I don't fit in that age group. It turns out that 60 people will die no matter what you do, and it's because of the diversity of the human capability to react to different substances. So that causes a lot of confusion and fuzziness in what we need to do. So the question is what combination of tools will help us to get the best focus, recognizing that any problem we look at is gonna have a distribution of things that we may never detect but what is the best distribution to find? I would agree though that, um, that uh, focusing on MCMs makes it almost easier to define a set of data that will be useful in some way. And I, I don't know that if you can see this fancy thing, but this is a flow chart. It's an algorithm for a dual model anthrax response. It has basic questions. These questions need to be answered. They can be answered by putting the answers into, a, into fields in a database. Um, it would seem to me that this algorithm drives the production of a database um, that is usable at every level. Um, and I, that's kind of, seems like common sense, doesn't it? <laughs> Small point about the EHR formats. Again, I still practice, and I'm suffering through the ICD-10 conversions <laughs> and the new financial formats they have on top of that. And what I'm beginning to feel is that, one, for a clinician trying to work quickly, because normally I'll work either in the ER or the intensive care units, I don't have time to figure out all these formats, and I can't put just pneumonia and then get back to it later. I have to say it's a clepsiella pneumonia beforehand. So I get, think it tends to force people to say things they're not ready to say or can't be verified later. I think it's worth a conversation with the EHR structures, whether it's Cerner or Epix or any of the others. Maybe we need to step back and just really think about it, because I know it's great for financing. I can tell you within one penny what I've obligated the hospital to spend for a particular patient, but I couldn't always tell you if I collected the right information, and there are a lot of examples of that. Yeah. So we spent a lot of time talking about uh, electronic health records um, and the sort of challenges, the ugly parts of that, and the challenges related to that. Uh, when, with the planning committee, we'd come up with a, a list of other challenges around data, and they included, included some of the things that we've mentioned, so standardization, um, that the data is dispersed uh, across many different sources during an event, um, connecting data sources to so that integration, uh, compiling and analyzing the data, the reliability and validity of the data, uh, the dangers of crowdsourcing and data mining, um, the use and availability of analytical tools, structured versus unstructured, uh, and then several things that were mentioned earlier. So um, different data sources have issues connected to velocity, variety, and, and volume. And we also, in this conversation, one thing that's come up is kind of the root causes of some of this ugliness. So, you know, maybe systems were designed to benefit the physicians, or maybe they were designed to benefit the people billing for these things. What are some of the, um, the reasons why you think we haven't been able to get our acts together with MCM data and with regard to safety and efficacy. Why haven't we been, we been able to pull together the data we need to answer these questions? My sense is it might be a little bit too early to answer that question because if you actually map out the, the frequency of MCMs over the past 10 years, it's a nice map, I can't remember who presented it, but you have a lot of new MCMs, the Katrinas, the Ebola's, all of a sudden it's coming at an increasing frequency, so we're being forced to ask questions that we really hadn't had a chance to really think about in great depth. So it could be the relative newness of it, the change in the variety of information we have, and our just emerging understanding that all data is good, but the question is, what does the data tell you? Because sometimes it can be something very small or something very big, and we have to try to get this in a way that we can actually, between a number of different specialties, communicate all these things at the same time. So there are multiple things that are occurring, and I think we're in the process of converting to whatever that next step is. And you see it in tools, too. If you look at tools, our tools that we use for analytics used to be single tools that could do just Bayesian analysis, and then I'd walk across the hall and do frequentist analysis over here. Now the tools have all, all integrated in one place. And then there's a next stage beyond that where you don't worry about the tools, you just select the databases and you pull what you need and then you assemble it. But that requires the person doing that assembling be a unicorn or a cousin of a unicorn or something <laughs> like that. That's the change I'm seeing. Yeah, so you're uh, suggesting that perhaps this uh, 
sort of discomfort we're feeling with the current status as normal, as, as something is evolving and changing. We're having growing pains, yeah. perhaps. Okay, what else? What are some of the other root causes of our current status? Maybe it's not the root cause, it's just intrinsically. If we look at public health in the United States, it's a heterogeneous system, right? It's, so we are not dealing with a, a unified system where everybody has the same standard of collecting data and everybody is sharing data. I think, I think sharing of uh, information is critical and it remains a challenge because I think even within healthcare organization is that uh, the division, even just the same, same state departments, they don't share information. And hospital network, you could have eight hospitals under the same network. They don't, they're not, it's not like they don't want to talk to each other. They don't have one single system. So I think intrinsically, the healthcare system in the United States is very complex. And so I think we are in some sense trying to connect them. Maybe sometimes, the, that's the reason why I think I want to make, make sure that we don't miss is that we will have to march on to connect them, whether it is just 10 sites or 20 sites or 100 sites. If our goal is to get a final system, but if we will say, okay, let's wait until everybody is signing on and we're gonna start building it, then we will never be able to build it, right? Because I think, I think the challenge on us is really because of the way the public health and the healthcare system is designed. And so I would not say it is like us being so dumb or anything, right? But, but on the other hand, it is, it is um, vertical and horizontal. There are a lot of, uh, a lot of operational um, limitations that we have to overcome. And, and I think we all try to overcome. So that's, that's one of the, that's how I see it. Okay. Evolving into something better than it exactly. was. Exactly. Yeah. Even though there's no you know, cohesive plan to get it there, mm -hmm. people move in that direction. Yeah, that's how I see that. I think because if you look at EMR, um, look back in the old days that they used paper form, which we may we may find that very silly, but but we really are seeing the doctors are pulling things from from the system. So I I really see that we are marching forward, but we have to connect them together. Okay. Um, well, y'all have left me feeling a bit hopeful about things. Uh, maybe we do have our acts together more than we were giving ourselves credit for. So quick round of applause for the panelists. Thank you so much for sharing with us. I'm going to invite you to return to your seats for this next part of the conversation. And I'm going to go down to the floor. So you can turn off your mics. <laughs>